So you've probably noticed this video is uh, over an hour long, easily making it the uh, longest of these videos I've done yet, but uh, trust me, it's worth it. Hello friends! 30 seconds to showtime. Welcome back to yet another installment of my Dota 2 strategy series, where I'm going to show you the essentials of playing a certain hero and how to have a really good time with them, and I have really been looking forward to this one. Um, if my uh, video of Dirge the Undying is any impression, I like strength heroes that can run around and uh, cause all sorts of havoc all over the map, and there is hardly anybody better than Bristleback. I love this hero. Matter of fact, he's kind of giving Undying a run for his money as uh, my preferred hero of choice whenever I just want to pick something and screw around. So... All that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and get, and get uh, right into this. This is going to be a uh, very, very long game. And a couple of the key things that I'm going to make a point of this video to talk about is, uh, number one, I make a lot of uh, early game mistakes. There's my first one right there. <laughs> Not getting quite a very good block. But um, I make quite a few early game mistakes, both in uh, my item choices, my item progression, and uh, some of the decisions that we make. So I'm actually going to be talking quite a bit about things I could have done better this game. And I'm also going to be talking about the essentials of playing uh, Bristleback and what your mentality should be when you're playing this hero. So, got a little bit of a pause here. We're going to start it back right. up. Let's there go and take a really quick look at the lanes and kind of give you an assessment of how I feel about them. We're going to have a uh, Bristleback Lion versus a Luna Venomancer. I feel like uh, Bristleback Lion actually has a pretty good edge here, and I'll explain why in just a second. But we're also going to have a... Uh, Pudge versus Queen of Pain, or I'm sorry, not Pudge, but Brewmaster versus Queen of Pain. Brewmaster is in a lot of trouble in that matchup. Here we're going to have an Undying solo versus a Windrunner solo, so that's kind of interesting. But uh, anyway, uh, very first thing I want to point out here before I even talk about Bristleback, Bristleback skills is um, I made a little bit of a different um, item choice this game in terms of my starting items. Typically on Bristleback, and uh, I would very rarely deviate from this, I very, very, very strongly recommend that you... Pick up, God, I, I miss so many creeps here. This is, it is painful to watch. I very strongly recommend that you pick up a stout shield with your basic regeneration and either fill the rest with a couple clarities or uh, some branches. Or if you have random gold, uh, I am a huge fan of the uh, Quelling Blade stout shield start. And I'm going to quickly explain why I feel this way. Bristleback is a hero that you can play extremely aggressively, really from level 2 onwards, even from level 1 onwards if you have the right setup. Like, say you go into a tri-lane with, like, a Venno, Lion, or, you know, some, uh, uh, you basically you go into a lane with a lot of crowd control right off the bat. However, I did not start with a stout shield this time around. What this means is that I cannot be nearly as aggressive as I want to be against these heroes. Look how much damage that Venomanch's right clicks are doing to me already. That sucks. And, like... Having the Lunar Blessing on top of that, this starting item build is an absolute disaster. Just even things that seem kind of insignificant like this, like uh, starting with a Ring of Protection versus a Stout Shield Quelling Blade, like it makes all the difference in the world here. We maybe could have already gotten a kill in this lane, possibly. Um, I would have had a lot more CS, that's for sure, so I would have had quite a bit more farm. And... Luna against the Bristleback, this is not a good matchup for Luna at all. Unfortunately, we do have an Invisible Ogre here. I'm going to react and try to do what I can. Um, should have went on the Ogre instead of the Luna, but... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we're not going to get anything out of that. But what I do want you to notice is, look how much damage I did to these three heroes there. Bristleback is a, an absolute AoE monster and the king of just spreading damage all over the place. So that being said, um, I'm going to stop beating the hell out of myself for this bad item oh god this this is bad do not okay i'm gonna talk about it a little bit more <laughs> the reason that this is so bad is because luna is a hero that is easily targeted by bristleback starts with a low hp not look at this very really greedy build too she's going for a really quick minus here like if i jump on her at all and lion is able to help me in any way even with one stun like, uh, the Venomancer is probably not going to be able to save her, but the fact that I don't have a Stout Shield on me means I'm going to take so much more damage from Creeps, I'm going to take so much more damage from her Lunar Blessing, and picking up, like, the Basilius at the side shop, which I don't think I even do for a really long time anyways, is not wise. But Anyway, aside from all that, if you're not familiar with Bristleback at all, or if you're fairly familiar with him but you want to know a little bit more about his skills, I'm going to talk about those now. Bristleback's first skill, uh, Viscous Nasal Goo, breaking out the old biological warfare. Think about the only hero in the game that uh, has this, so which is it's pretty awesome. 
This skill, uh, by the way, you can Bristleback skills are extremely spammable. They're all fairly low mana cost, and a Bristleback has the highest intelligence gain out of any strength hero in the game at uh, 2.8 at the time I'm making this video, so that's pretty cool. Uh, mana is generally not as big of an issue for Bristleback as it is a lot of other strength heroes. Comparatively, say, Brewmaster, who only gains 1.25 per level. So uh, Bristleback really has the luxury of having an extremely high intelligence gain for a strength hero. A relatively respectable strength gain and agility about average for a strength hero. But um, Viscous Nasal Goo is a very low cooldown at 1.5 seconds. This ability is a slow and it's also an uh, armor debuff. This has a stack limit of up to 4. And the one thing I do want to point out quickly about this, and I'm going to talk about this on each of his other abilities too, is that this ability, it will refresh itself as you cast it on a target. So that means the stacks are not independent. If a person has, say, three stacks on them and the duration is about to expire, I can cast it again, they'll gain a four stack and it will refresh the duration of all the stacks, if that makes sense. Quill Spray and Warpath do not work this way, the stacks are independent. As in, the stacks in Quill Spray say if they have five stacks on them, it'll go down depending on the time the stacks are applied. I can't just cast Quill Spray, get them to have six stacks, and then have the stacks completely all refreshed. Doesn't work that way on Quill Spray or Warpath. But this skill is a really, really powerful. It's extremely potent even at level 1. And uh, you can get a 32%... Yeah, so you can get a 32% slow at level 1 if you have 4 stacks. Starts out at a base slow of 20, which is actually pretty respectable for a slow at level 1. And you gain slow per stack, as you can see, 3, 6, 9, 12, depending on the level. And it also gets rather powerful as you take it from level 2 to level 3, which is kind of interesting. As in, they lose 2 more armor other than 1. Versus uh, level 2 to 3. I explained that really badly, <laughs> but the, you get the idea. Whenever you go from level 2 to level 3, you're now draining 2 armor per stack of nasal goo. And it goes up to a 68% yeah, sixty-eight percent slow at uh, level 4. So... We have the Ogre did dive on the line back here. I'm going to go ahead and just try to get something out of this. Thankfully, the Luna does die. The reason I'm not pursuing the Venomancer here, by the way, is because I felt like I wasn't going to be able to get him anyway. However, I think, in retrospect, that was a huge mistake. I forgot just how low mana cost that uh, Nasal Goo is. I could have popped a Clarity, which I had. I could have kept running after this guy. I think I gave away a kill there. Me turning around and attacking the Ogre like I did, um, arguably a pretty big mistake, and we very likely could have gotten a double kill out of that. Now, that being said, killing the Luna in exchange for the line and uh, me getting the kill for that is going to be a huge help to me, considering the horrendously bad start that I had in this lane. Ideally, I want to be able to get a kill with Bristleback by level 3 or 4. Like, if I don't... Um, Something's probably wrong. I, I kind of feel the same way about this hero as I do when dying, in that you just completely snowball out of control. That being said, uh, Bristleback Snowball ability, Quill Spray. This is Bristleback's signature ability, and uh, you're going to be hitting your W key on the keyboard a lot when you're playing this guy. Three second cooldown ability at 35 mana. This does physical damage in a fairly large AoE, as you can see by the uh, range indicator there. And this levels up pretty well. So let's, at level 4, it does 80 damage per spray. And also, you gain stacking damage as the quills go off. So, let's say I hit a tar Actually, something is about to happen here. I'm actually going to pause the video for a second. Okay. Um, I'm going to finish my discourse on this, but then I want to talk about something pretty important that's going to happen here. But uh, the thing with Quill Spray is this ability is... Again, I kind of think of Bristleback like I do Undying. Like, Undying's Tombstone, a lot of people underestimate this in the fact that the longer it's on the field, the stronger it gets, and all of a sudden they realize they've been completely overwhelmed. And like, oh god, oh god, the zombies, oh Christ. This is kind of the way that Bristleback's Cool Spray works. So let's actually not take my level 4, let's take like a level 2 example. Like around the time, like say around level 3, I'm probably going to have a... By the way, my preferred level 3 build is uh, generally to have 2 points in Cool Spray and 1 point in Nasal Goo. This game I went a 1-1-1 one, one, one by level 3 because I felt like I really needed the uh, damage block passive to kind of stay relevant. I really felt um, I was losing control of this lane, which is absolutely unforgivable versus two fairly squishy heroes like this and Bristleback line. But um, let's say at level 2 Cool Spray, I'm going to do 40 damage on initial cast with stacking damage of 30. Right? So generally what this means is you're going to do 40 damage per cast, but you're also going to do 30, 60, 90, 120 bonus. That is awesome. Now, and one thing to keep in mind is it does have a max damage cap of 400. It's pretty hard to hit this. You're not going to be able to hit this manually by casting this. You're only going to be able to hit the max stacks on this if you passively cast 
uh, Quill Spray from Bristleback's passive Bristleback. This ability is pretty straightforward in that it does uh, damage reduction depending where you get hit from. Extremely, extremely powerful too. And uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to draw this out all that well, but um, whenever it says Bristleback's side, what that means is take his back and go in a 110 degree cone from Bristleback. That represents his sides. Whenever it says his back, that means it's 70 degrees from the back. So, um, kind of hard to visualize this, but again, imagine Bristleback is a circle. And again, take the center point of his back, 110 degrees out is his side, 70 degrees out is his back. So that's the way to think of it. It's pretty forgiving. Um, granted, it's not like, say, 180 degrees from his side, so it's not overpowered, but... Um, Generally speaking, if you know you're about to take a lot of damage, a big nuke, like a great example is a Finger of Death from the Line. If you know you're about to get hit by this, or you're pretty sure you are, turn your back. Not only is this going to do a massive amount of damage reduction to you, but also if you take 250 damage, you're going to go ahead and release a Quill Spray as well. This is how you get up to the max level, or the max stacks of Quill Spray using this skill. The only way to do it is to take a lot of damage off of your passive. And believe it or not, it's going to happen more often than you might think. Um, Hitting the max damage cap of 400 is a little ambitious, but uh, you can get kind of close from time to time. Um, another thing I want to point out, too, is this is not blocked by damage block um, items like, say, a uh, stout shield. Anybody have a stout shield? I need a stout shield. But anyway, it is uh, not blocked by damage block ability, so like this melee block of 20 and range block of 10 it does, is not affected by this or Vanguard or um, Kraken Shell on Tidehunter does not take this into account. It does take into account armor, because it's a physical damage attack. And uh, I will talk about Warpath, but I feel like I'm getting a little bit uh, long-winded here talking about Bristleback skills. But um, what I want to talk about here is um, just generally being aware of what you can get away with at a given time. Okay, I actually have an XP advantage over these two guys now, thankfully, because they did that dive on our Lion, and we were able to get a kill. And it's at this point that if I don't go for a kill here, Things are going to get bad. The Luna should not ever be able to get away with a build like this. And the reason I say that is because all she has is a Hand of Midas. That's it. She doesn't even have brown boots. Like, the closest thing to a defensive item she has is a Ring of Protection. That's it. And that's not really going to make much difference at all if I get up in her face and just start clobbing, clobbing her with the old rock on a stick that Bristleback likes. So, in this particular case, like, if Luna or Venomancer gets, like, even within this amount of range... They should die. And the reason I'm emphasizing this so much is because I see a lot of people play heroes like Bristleback and like Undying, but kind of lose awareness in at what point their hero is the strongest in the game. Like right now, um, Undying's, and uh, props to this Undying, he's doing my preferred build. I like you, you're a good guy. <laughs> but uh, at, at this point in the game, like Undying is at his absolute strongest. Unfortunately, he's in a, a 1v1 matchup that's not too favorable for Undying. A Windrunner should be able to win this lane in most cases. But uh, this is the point where Undying is the strongest, and he should probably uh, consider moving out of the lane and maybe even come up here with me. As for myself, um, I'm ready to kill. So, like, the moment I'm in range to attack somebody, I'm ready for it. And, by the way, even just one level of Bristleback is really, really strong. But uh, I'm going to go and start the video back up. And I believe we actually do go for a kill here. And, uh, yep, right there. Okay, so that was the critical moment. Venomancer got right in range for me to uh, throw some snot on him. And I'm actually able to hit both of them with a cool spray. Look at how much damage that is even with just one stack. Now, what you're about to see here is the beauty of the skill and why it, it just... It, this is a great snowball skill in terms of how people kind of under, underestimate how much damage it's going to do. Let's go and start it back up. And I realize that Luna's going to be a more valuable target here, so I'm going to start going on her. Again, make sure to always be using these abilities. Incredibly low cooldown, so make sure you're aware of that. Don't just be running after somebody and not actually using your abilities. Great stun by the line, getting the... Uh, the old doubler there. Auto attack's gonna finish her off. Give the old Venomancer the right click, and that is gonna be a double kill for us. Okay, so things that we did right there. And, matter of fact, what I should really talk about more is things the enemy did wrong there. Is you gotta be aware of like the lane matchup and what they can do against you. The Bristleback Lion, uh, Lion has an immense amount of lockdown with his Earth Spike and Hex. What that means is that Bristleback is gonna be able to stay on top of a hero for longer than he really has any right to be able to do so. The more stacks of Quill Spray I can get on somebody, and the more stacks of Nasal Goo I can get on somebody, the quicker they're gonna die. 
Now, you probably noticed as well, they took a ton of right-click damage. That leads me to talk about uh, Bristleback's Radiant last skill, Warpath. This ability actually does give Bristleback some amount of carry potential, which is uh, really, really cool. So it's a passive ability, pretty straightforward. As you use abilities, you can see I gain stacks of Warpath. Double you can damage. gain a max of 5, 6, or 7 stacks of this, depending on your level. It gives you a damage bonus, and it gives you movement bonus. It is awesome. I love this. So you can see right now, um, with just one stack, moving 5% faster and dealing 20 bonus damage. Even at level 1, if I have 5 stacks of this, that's 100 damage. That's a lot. <laughs> that is a lot of damage. For comparison, a, a Sacred Relic gives 60 damage. Okay? So you're getting close to, like, almost two Sacred Relics on you. Um, you are getting an Abyssal Blade's worth of damage at level 1 if you have five stacks of this. It's pretty easy to get up to five stacks, by the way. Um, every time you cast Quill Spray or Nasal Goo, you'll get a stack of this. Um, however, getting uh, passive stacks, or I'm sorry, getting uh, passive sprays off your Bristleback uh, will not add to Warpath. So again, Warpath does give Bristleback quite a bit of actual uh, carry potential, but what it also means is that you don't have to buy damage items at all. This hero does not need them. Um, the Ogre showed himself, which is uh, debatably a mistake, because I probably would have went on somebody there, so looks like we're just going to kind of back off for a minute. Uh, what I would do want to talk about here quickly is a uh, skill progression. I feel like at uh, level 7, your skills should look like this pretty much every single time. But um, there is some amount of uh, debate, and I think this is um, almost player preference. Do you want to max Bristleback, or do you want to max Nasal Goo? I prefer maxing Bristleback. Again, the Luna got a bit too close. Good stun, good hex. Look at how much damage that is. Absolutely insane. Bristleback is also the absolute king of tower diving. You might think this is a little bit aggressive, and we're probably going to die for it. That is not the case. Not at all. Now, what the Lion should have probably let me tank it, but uh, he did that correctly. I take the tower aggro off of him, by the way. That's a really useful thing you can do if you're not, uh, if you weren't familiar with that. If a allied hero is taking tower damage, treat him just like as if they were a creep, and you're trying to take tower aggro off. Just uh, force attack them, and you'll take a uh, tower aggro off of them. I don't think he would have died, but it made sure that I saved him quite a bit of HP there, which is nice. Top towers. But um, anyway, Bristleback is the absolute king of tower diving, and the reason he is is because of this skill. Yep, she TP's back in, but I don't even care. It's time to go here. Okay. Really important thing that's happening here. Now, I know what you're thinking, like, Christ, this guy's insane. Why are you doing this? Uh, Luna is... Whenever she hits that level 6 mark, things do get a little bit tougher because she's able to do so much damage to me here. But uh, what you'll notice I'm doing is I'm not just sitting here trying to beat on here. I'm trying to immediately turn my side and turn my back to her. Now, that being said, I'm honestly not sure if Eclipse takes into account whether you're fighting from the rear, but most all of the other abilities in the game do. Um, let's take like an odd example. Let's say Venomancer uses a Poison Nova on me. As long as my back, or, or let's say Poison Nova or uh, Poison Sting or Gale, as long as my back is to him or my side is to him, I will take reduced damage. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to make sure that I get my back to Luna as quickly as I possibly can. Very, very important. If I sit here and just try to right click her, it's not going to work, and I'm going to die anyway because they do have TP support coming in. I'm going to start it back up, and I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Okay. I think I... I think that worked. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure if um, I was able to block damage. I don't know if Luna's Eclipse actually takes into account like your positioning, whether it hits from the back. I know um, a good example of this is uh, Juggernaut's ultimate does not care whether you're facing him or not. It will always hit you from the front. Which kind of sucks. It actually, makes Juggernaut reasonably okay Die versus this hero. But um, aside from that, uh, you saw how much damage she took in an incredibly short amount of time. And I do want to finish my discourse on Bristleback skill build too before I forget about it. Um, I prefer maxing Bristleback first, and the reason I do this is because I really feel like Bristleback should be an incredibly active hero and an extremely aggressive hero, kind of like Night Stalker. You're going to be diving towers nonstop. Bristleback is the ability that allows you to do this. It's really, really good. Um, if Nasal Goo went from Dyer's one armor loss to two armor five. loss per level, from level one to level two, I might consider leveling this up first. However, what I do want to emphasize is that I would not fault anybody for taking a Max Goo over Max Bristleback build. However, you do you must have at least one level in Bristleback. Uh, that's something that you just simply have to have. Now, all that being said here, um, I'm thankfully managing to catch up quite a bit because we were able to get some kills in lane. Again, getting kills with this guy is elementary. If your abilities are off cooldown, use them. Die is mid I make a slight mistake there. I, I should have, uh, I wasn't using them quite as quickly as I could have there. Bam. 
I didn't have to cast that last goo either. Just a minor thing, but just little things like that can add up. You know, that's 30 more mana than I, that I would have right now if I didn't cast that last goo on him. Reason being, because he already had four stacks, and I really, there was no way the stacks were going to expire by the time I got to him and hit him one more time, so didn't have to do that. But you can see, basically, if Bristleback sees you, you're dead. <laughs> that's what I like so much about this hero, is you absolutely cannot yeah, run from down. this guy. Even at level one nasal goo, you don't really need more levels in it for the slow. Like, granted, it, it does get uh, considerably better, but the fact that it starts out at uh, level one so strong means that I really don't feel like you have to level this too often. You can see now with four levels in Bristleback, I have 40% damage reduction from the rear and 20% from the side. That's a lot. That's awesome. Now, um, one other quick thing I want to talk about as well is that my itemization here is quite poor. Um, I picked up a late stout shield because I realized, man, my uh, my experimentation was a um, pretty poor decision. But then, then again, that's how you learn. You know, I, I made a mistake, and uh, I picked up a stout shield a little bit later on in the game, and I'm extremely glad that I did because being able to stay alive is key for Bristleback. I get more damage than I can possibly really need at this point in the game from Warpath, Goo, and the stacks off of Quills. I don't have to worry about mining damage items for a very, very, very long time, if ever, um, unless I do somehow transition to more of a, <coughs> excuse me, a carry roll, maybe, but until then I really don't have to. But um, I've got, you can, as you can see, my inventory is completely full of early game items, with like the exception of Power Treads, that's about it. So, um, before I talk about this more, I want to talk about why I'm doing what I'm doing here. I know that right now, um, according to the map, Luna is not here. Luna is not here. Luna is not here. Therefore, she must be here. She has to be farming the jungle right now. Going a Midas build like this, uh, she doesn't have any life still yet, so she's going to have a, a little bit of a hard time. But uh, I know that Luna is somewhere on the map, and I know she's farming. It's my job as Bristleback to make sure that she cannot do this. That is incredibly critical. If I'm caught out by the enemy team in some way, which um, I have a pretty good idea where you know positioning is right now. I saw this guy TP in a moment ago. I know that Windrunner's still bottom. I know they're kind of spread out, but and again, if I am caught out, the fact that I have cl close to 1300 HP and I have max levels in Bristleback means that I can get away with a lot of stuff here. Bristleback is a very forgiving hero in the fact that it takes a long time to kill you. Like, let's say I do get caught out here, like maybe the Queen of Pain shows up. There's a good chance I might be able to run down here. I can get TP support from mid. We can probably turn the fight around right then and there. Not a lot of other ganking heroes can really say that. Like, say, if you're caught out as a bounty hunter, you're caught out as Slark, you're caught out as Ricky, you're probably going to die. Bristleback is the exception to that in that you are incredibly survivable. So, start it back up and... Uh, I think we all oh one more quick thing too is I'm actually using my abilities even when nothing else is going on because I want to make sure my stacks of warpath are um, as high as they possibly can be. So right now I got four stacks, I have max stacks, nine percent faster and one hundred bonus damage right now. So if I right click her, she's dead. Well, close. <laughs> Took a little bit. Venomancer shows up and again max stacks of warpath. Look at that bonus two hundred damage. Three hits, he's gone. Take a multicast, but again, the Bristleback is going to block 40% of that just because I got hit from the rear. I go and TP out here. Um, pretty conservative decision on my part, actually. I really didn't need to. I really don't feel like they're going to be able to kill me, even if um, other people do show up there. But that's the... In summary, that was like a good 20 seconds of the power of Bristleback. I run around the map. I want to make sure I keep my stacks of Warpath up, but keep in mind that... Don't run, don't run yourself out of mana, but um, I'm just doing this so I can get to the lane faster and I can start farming more and I can start killing people more. Looks like they're having a little bit of trouble over there, so uh, that's not so good. But uh, aside from that, itemization, magic wand, um, probably more core on this hero than about anybody. Being able to boost your HP back up a little bit and the fact that you have so many low mana cost abilities means that, like, say, getting off, like... Gosh, I was about to say 10 stacks, but hell, even like 5 or 6 uh, charges of wand. That's another like that's another cast of goo and quills right there, just like even 5 or 6 stacks. Not to mention if you get you know, like 10 or 15 charges on that thing, you're going to turn around and be right back in the fight. Uh, power treads are definitely my boot of choice in this hero. Um, again, I really don't feel like a... God, oh my god, the TPs! <laughs> This is a situation, by the way, where we really need to push him in. But um, boots of choice on Bristleback. I really, really enjoy power treads. I feel like they, it really gives him about everything he needs. Movement speed and uh, attack speed. You get 
um, attack speed because you have all the damage you really need off of War Pass. So I don't feel like Phase are really necessary. And uh, probably not a dude I would go on him. And mana is generally not an issue thanks to your high intelligence gain and with some of my other item choices as well. So they really can't fight this, which is good for us. Gonna be able to take a tower, do get the last hit again. At least my, I think my entire back was turned up. But you saw how little damage I took from uh, that fireball, just thanks to uh, the bristleback passive. Trouble brewing at Radiance Bottom. Tower. Also get another level in Warpath here, which is great. And to uh, kind of finish my discourse on early starting items here again, I feel like Stout Shield is absolutely mandatory on this hero because of his aggressive play style. And uh, Ring of Basilius, I do, actually don't think is all that good. And uh, yeah, I will talk about the Vanguard. By the way, don't please don't close the video yet. I, I will talk about this. Um, I really feel like uh, Ring of Basilius is not the best choice on this hero. The reason I say that is because even though that 0.6 mana regen might be kind of tempting, yeah, I'm kind of kind of going a little bit hard here, but uh, we're not actually able to catch up and get any kills, and I'm pretty low on HP now, but uh, Basilius is not all that great. The reason I say that is because Basilius, the 0.6 mana regen, I'm actually going to get an immense... I'm going to get a lot more benefit out of something that actually gives me percentage-based mana regen like an Earnest Shadows versus Basilius. I have both of them this game. Right now I have 3.3 mana regen per second, which is incredibly high for a strength hero at this level. Uh, for a comparison, Brewmaster is getting half of that. That's bad. <laughs> uh, Brewmaster has a lot of mana issues like that. But um, I really don't think Basilius is a terrible choice, but I feel like there are better choices for Bristleback. The gold can be better invested. Earnest Shadows, I feel like, benefits this hero more than about any other hero in the entire game. This gives you everything you need. The fact that you have naturally high intelligence means that the 50% mana regen you get off of this is going to benefit you a lot more, say, someone with low intelligence like uh, Brewmaster. Brewmaster would benefit much more off Ring of Basilius than I would. Brewmaster is going to benefit more from that because he's going to be able to use the bonus damage a little bit better. He's going to be able to use the mana regen much better than I could, or it's going to stay relevant longer than it will. And also the armor is probably going to be more relevant for him too. That's an easy kill. I get the last hit with Cool Spray, so that's always nice. But uh, um, don't worry too. If you're fairly new to the game, don't worry um, too terribly much like about the uh, Basilius Urn discourse I just went, went on. But uh, what is important is that you understand you understand the logic behind it. Why this item would benefit someone like Brewmaster much more than it benefits me. While saying Urn of Shadows, which is good on both heroes, by the way, but I feel like it benefits me more than it benefits the Brewmaster. Same idea here. I want to make sure I turn my back um, and my side to the loon as quickly as I can. And she dies. Uh, good support by the lion, by the way. I might have died there. I'm not entirely sure. This is why Earnest Shadows is awesome. Um, not just for the flat stats, which uh, by themselves are awesome, but you probably notice I've been using the Earnest Shadows active uh, pretty liberally this game. Bristleback is a hero that's naturally going to get a lot of kills, or hopefully you will. That means you're going to accumulate Earn Charges. If you're not familiar with how Earn Charges work, you can use it to heal yourself or an ally for 400 HP, or you can use it to apply 150 damage to an enemy, which is HP removal, by the way, so it's always going to be a flat 150 damage. I love this item. This is absolutely core on Bristleback, and uh, if you haven't tried it, be sure to do so. This is the ultimate ganker's item. It is incredibly powerful. Not only that, the plus 6 strength, which translates to 114 HP, that's considerable. So at this point in the game, I have over 1600 HP Radiant's at level 13, and I have a lot of early game items, so I'm ready to fight. Now, finally, we're going to talk about this Vanguard. I feel like... Um, Radiance There's not too many heroes years. that I like getting Vanguard on anymore, as my general awareness about the game has increased. Bristleback is a hero that I actually do like to get Vanguard on. The reason I say this is because Bristleback only need, uh, needs items that really keep you alive. My mana regen is fine, my HP regen is going to be supplemented by this, and you might be thinking, well, if you take damage block, you're not going to be able to get as many passive sp uh, sprays off your... Bristleback. Reason being is because Bristleback um, only takes into account the actual damage that you take. If you take damage block, it will not count that towards the 250 towards getting a cool spray passive. But the thing is, is that the longer that I can stay alive, the better. However, I feel like it wasn't that wise of a choice this game. Reason being is, look at their lineup. There is really only one hero on this entire team I have to worry about physical damage, Luna. Everyone else deals a ton of magical burst damage. 
Queen of Pain. Guess Ogre. what's happening today. Venno does a lot of uh, DOT damage. Not burst, but an immense amount of damage over time. And uh, Luna's uh, Eclipse does quite a bit of burst damage by itself. So what this means is that instead of getting a Vanguard, I really should have opted for a Hood instead, in retrospect. That would have plugged up the holes that I have in wanting you know, a little bit more HP regen, but it also would have meant that I would have had a ton more effective HP versus magic damage. Let's take a really quick look at Hood, just in case you're not familiar with it. So, a ton of HP regen would have given me 30% spell resistance, so think of it this way. I would have had almost 50% uh, magic resistance, and if I take like a, uh, a sonic wave to the back, not only am I going to take roughly about half the damage from it, but I'm also going to resist 40% more of that from the uh, Bristleback passive. It's not going to do very much. Well, the Vanguard is not really doing all that much for me in this game, so... Um, I really feel like my item, my itemization here could have been a lot better, and picking up a Vanguard this game was a mistake. Games where I feel like otherwise it would have been fine is against heroes that, uh, well, if they had more right-click. But uh, notable examples of this would be heroes like Enigma, Broodmother. Heroes with a lot of summons uh, that can, like, that damage block really, really adds up against. Uh, Bristleback is an incredibly is strong Broodmother cannon, by the way. If you're having trouble versus that hero lately, thanks to rebuffs and 6.79, give this guy a try. Bristleback is also probably um, the hardest counter to Undying in the entire game because your damage is physical, it will kill zombies instantly. This means the Tombstone can't uh, get stacked to zombies going on. So, as ha sad as it makes me to say it, uh, Bristleback completely crushes Undying in about every single way. So, uh, if you're against an Undying and you want to be uh, an old counter picker, uh, pick Bristleback because you will absolutely destroy that hero. So, all that being said, um, at this point in the game, I have quite a large gold surplus. Um, and the Vanguard choice really makes my next progression difficult. There's a lot of things I can do in this here in terms of advancing the items. I want to reserve that discussion here for um, what I want to talk about now, which is how should we proceed throughout the rest of this game. I don't feel like we're going to be able to outcarry this Luna. That's bad. So, what I'm encouraging here, I'm saying, look guys, we need to fight right now. Even with Luna losing, uh, uh, using a level 2 Eclipse, I'm able to only get down to about half HP off of that. Brewmaster's going to use his ultimate. Pretty good use of that there. And uh, we're really just trying to force a fight, again, because I don't feel like we're going to be able to take on these guys if the game goes much later. Kind of an optimistic TP on my part, but if I didn't TP, I have about all the uh, DOTs you can possibly imagine on me right now. Even the Fountains having trouble keeping up. Dyer's mid towers having technical So I would say, uh, overall, good TP, good fight by us. Uh, Brewmaster does have his Blink finish. We're able to take out three heroes. Looks like we're probably also going to be able to take a, a Tier 2 tower out of this as well, which is nice. Looks like they are going to try to defend. Queen of Pain getting in pretty deep. Gosh, I love that about Undying. Do you see that damage bonus? Flesh go Golem into Soul Rip. I really need to make another Undying video. Gotta love that hero. Anyway, alright. So, our strategy here needs to be, can we really outcarry this Luna? The answer is, I don't know. Um, while Bristleback does have quite a fair amount of carry potential himself, thanks to the Warpath passive, I mean, at level... At level 3, with 7 stacks of this, you get 210 damage. That's 2 Abyssal Blades. You get 210 bonus damage just from having 7 stacks of this going, which again is not that hard to get that level of stacks up. Uh, but at the same time, Bristleback suffers from the issue that he doesn't have, he's not a hard carry. He's more of like a guy, like, if he has to carry, he absolutely can. Kind of what I like about the hero is that if you do snowball, you're probably going to be a huge threat to the enemy team because you're going to be able to just right-click them to death. But the problem is that Luna can absolutely destroy my entire team. Enchantress isn't going to last long, and Dying is going to start falling off. Lion has uh, virtually no HP either. He's going to just die really quickly. And Brewmaster is not a hero that scales well into the late game. His ultimate and whatnot is excellent right now at about the 25-minute mark. But I am really about the only hero on this entire team that is going to... I'm the closest one that's going to be able to scale even relatively well. Enchantress is going to do okay, especially with this build going into an Aghanim. It's probably a BKB or Orchid. She's going to be able to do a lot of right-click damage, but... They have a ton of magic bursts. That is what heroes like Enchantress can't stand, and she's going to fall really quickly if they decide to focus her. So, we're in a little bit of trouble here if the game keeps going too much later. Bristleback is an excellent Roshan killer. He is extremely good at this. Using the armor debuff, 
he's already at minus one armor, minus three armor, you get the idea. Being able to apply such an armor debuff to Roshan like this is an enormous help. You can see how quickly he's going down. You can even even solo Roshan at a fairly early point in the game like this. Um, I probably would have would have been able to kill it alone, granted my health would have went down quite a bit. But we are able to pick up a Roshan there, which is going to be uh, really important for us as we uh, start to push into the base. Radiant structures must have been fortified. And I'm actually going to pause it real so quick right here. Okay, so I want to talk about a really key mistake, and you're probably noticing it right now. I dropped my TPs. What does that mean? That means that uh, this split push Queen of Pain, which is what she's been doing pretty much all game, like... I can't come down here and defend and farm this wave. It's going to have to be somebody else, which is fine, mind you. But um, I make this mistake quite a few times throughout the game. There comes a point when you need to sell your magic wand and your urn. And my itemization right now, it, it's crowded. Um, I'm going for an Assault Curious, by the way, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if you're against heroes like this Queen of Pain who's just going to try to split push us into Oblivion, you got to make sure you have TPs on you. This is a game, though, where I feel like our team should be sticking together pretty much all the time anyway because we're wanting to end the game. So at the same time, that means I don't have to worry about having TPs as much to save heroes that might be farming other lanes, but I need to have TPs so that our base just doesn't die. A way to counter this is let's take a more realistic example like a Nature's Prophet who can actually split push extremely well. She picks up a Necro Book at some point in the game, by the way, just to assist with this. But like a Nature's Prophet, the way that you counter that is you run into their base and kill everybody and racks them. And basically, if he doesn't go back home, his entire team is going to die and you're going to win the game. That's why you have to press decisions like this. Having the Aegis of the Immortal is really critical for this because it means I can run in and start a fight with impunity. Hopefully it will just blow everything on me. But uh, just a quick thing I wanted to talk about there. And uh, this game is actually so long that my uh, recording is actually going to run over if I don't pause real quick. So uh, I will be right back. Okay, sorry about that. Hopefully uh, it was just a very minor hiccup uh, from your perspective. But um, it took a little bit of time on my end. I, um, I record to a, uh, a dedicated 10k RPM drive. But... Um, Unfortunately, this game is so insanely long that I, there is absolutely no way I was going to be able to uh, get it all in one take, so you do what you got to do, right? Okay, so we got uh, quite a few new items coming out here, as uh, you can see over here on the side. I do have uh, my Assault Kyrus finished. Um, I feel like AC is absolutely core on this hero for uh, a lot of different reasons, but um, one of the main ones is uh, its uh, AoE armor debuff that it will uh, give to the enemy team, so... Uh, just by being in the AoE of this, you're actually reducing enemy armor around you by 5, and you're increasing your team's armor by 5. Really, really awesome. But basically what this means is uh, your quills are going to do a lot more damage, uh, especially over time as enemy armor values get higher, especially on uh, agility carries where their armor is going to scale naturally. It's going to help a lot. Uh, really, really like the sign on Bristleback. And not only that, too... But the fact that you get so much, essentially, free damage from Warpath means all you really kind of need is attack speed, and I feel like Assault Curious is just the absolute perfect item for that. So, highly recommend this item on uh, Bristleback if the game goes really any length at all. Again, not terribly pleased with my itemization so far, but uh, this was a good choice. So, I'm kind of just waiting in here because I really want to encourage a fight. Um, that, the Brewmaster really should have been uh, backing up so he can blink in, but uh, as for me... I'm not really too worried about it. You can see how incredibly quickly that Venomancer died. Going to jump on the Luna here. She realizes that she's going to have to back up. I'm getting pretty low myself, but you have to remember I do have the Aegis on me, so I'm going to be okay. And remember, use those Urn Charges like you saw there how I use it on the Wind Rudder. It's going to make sure I have just enough damage to take her down before she's going to be able to hit the Fountain. That 150 damage might not sound like a lot, but it can really add up. Thankfully, by this point, too, the Enchantress is doing quite a bit of right-click damage. So, um, while that might have seemed like a pretty good fight for us, there's kind of an issue here. Unfortunately, our Creep Wave isn't right up against the tower anymore, so that's kind of bad. And not only that, too, but they already have three of their heroes um, up. Well, we didn't kill everybody, mind you, but uh, three of their heroes are up. I'm taking quite a bit of damage here. Again, I want to make sure that my back is turned, obviously, so I don't take too much damage. And uh, we're going to kind of have to back up from this, and it looks like that is a pretty dead Enchantress, I think. Yes, but uh, that's alright. So, that was not so good. Um, I feel like a mistake that we made is we pushed way too hard in that base. We went way too hard, and we were actually were not able to get a Rax. And at this point in the game, too, I feel like any kills that they get are going to be more beneficial for them than kills that we get. And what I mean by that is I feel like 
that at least with the, uh, well, especially the Luna, but the Luna and the Queen of Pain, they're going to scale much better into the late game than most of the heroes on uh, our team are. Now, I know I've said throughout the video that uh, Bristleback himself is not traditionally um, a carry, even though he can carry. Um, he received some pretty potent changes in 6.79, particularly to Warpath and the uh, damage bonuses that it gives you that... Uh, Bristleback can be absolutely brutal as a carry if you have the right matchup. And that being said, what I should probably be going for here, um, given my weird itemization, is I'm still staying alive relatively well. It's not yet to the, the point in the game where like I really have to worry about my HP and survivability. I should probably be going for a basher. However, um, I'm going for a pipe at this point, an item that I should have had about 10 minutes ago, probably instead of getting that Vanguard. I think it's fine in a lot of cases to hold on to your stout shield just for the damage block and pass on Vanguard. Unless you're playing against a very heavy physical damage team, then I feel like Vanguard is actually still a fairly decent choice. This is the issue with the item, too. Is that as the game goes on, it's going to become less and less relevant, and it's going to be harder to really justify the choice, because I'm needing to make room for something else, and I'm going to have to blow about a thousand gold in expense. So a fairly decent initiation by the Brewmaster. Unfortunately, he does eat a 3x multicast, but a great soul rip is going to make sure that he's going to stay up a little bit longer than he than he should have. And I don't think he even, uh, he, well, he didn't even have his ultimate, and he's going to live, too. Got an Eclipse coming down. Taking quite a bit of damage here, but I ate pretty much all of that Eclipse, and just by watching what I just seen, I'm pretty sure that Eclipse um, is blocked by Bristleback, which is nice. Lincoln Sphere is, uh, by the way, Lincoln Sphere is definitely not the best item against the Bristleback because you have you could just pop it so easily with Nasal Goo. An immense amount of damage on that Queen of Pain too. It's really going to add up with the Bristleback is really all about adding things up. I've got stacks of goo, stacks of quills, stacks of warpath. I've got an assault curious on top of that. I'm probably gonna have an urn ticking down. He's all about building up like these things that kind of seem small and insignificant, building up momentum with them. Now, now the way that you kind of play against Bristleback is you absolutely cannot let this hero snowball. I, at the time of making this video, I honestly feel like Bristleback is really underrated. Oh, I like this too. Jump on the Venomancer. That's the old classic hide in the trees to get a pick kill. Pretty snazzy. I'm actually going to switch over the uh, Fog of War to the Radiant as well. But uh, Radiant, anyway, at this point, I'm going for um, a Hood. Now, what I didn't realize at, th at this time was uh, the Undying had a Hood himself. It looks like he's actually not going for a Pipe. So while I feel like the, this decision of mine is it's still not bad, and it's just, it's going to become... Its usefulness is not going to drop off. Like... Um, the Queen of Pain is only going to start hurting more and more, especially once she finally picks up an Ags, which she's very likely to do. Um, I really should not have turned around there. This actually might be my first death. I'm trying to remember again. I'm, I'm still using my abilities. Never, ever stop using your abilities on this hero. You want to make sure you keep your Warpath up. And if heroes are chasing you, like this, this is what Bristleback really excels at. That wasn't the best example right there because they would have just killed me. But um, if you have a bunch of people chasing you, like you can just keep spraying quills, and eventually you're probably going to be able to turn around and fight on them. There hasn't been too many examples of that this game because I'm just killing everything. But in a lot of times where you're taking a ton of damage, people are hitting you from the rear, all of a sudden they realize, you know, they've got about five stacks of quill spray on them, and then you can just turn the fight around and punch them and just... Yeah, it's awesome. So, Bristleback is an excellent hero at kind of baiting things out, and that's the role that I've been trying to serve that we've been trying to push into the base. Whenever we go and I've just been trying to say, hey, come get me, come get me, come attack me, then that's going to allow the Brewmaster to blink in, initiate, and it's also going to make sure the Undying has room to actually get his abilities off as well, not to mention the Lion and the Enchantress standing back. So, Bristleback is absolutely a hero that uh, I, I actually do recommend this hero for beginners. Um, Reason being is because he's generally very forgiving to play. You can get away with a lot of stuff that a lot of heroes would have no business doing. And really, as long as you're pressing buttons, you're doing something. That's a, a nice thing about the hero, and honestly kind of makes him relaxing to play, is you, precision and like accuracy in using your abilities well is not something that you have to worry about as Bristleback. So definitely a great beginner hero. I would recommend him to anybody that's interested in just starting out the game. It's also nice to not just instantly dying all the time as well. Now, again, like I was um, about to say before, a way to play against this hero is you absolutely cannot let him snowball. Kind of the same way um, that a Night Stalker plays, except I 
I actually feel like Bristleback scales a little bit better than a Night Stalker does. But uh, it, you just, it's really all going to depend on effectively that first round of ganking, or like Night Stalker, that first night. If Bristleback does not have a good time, well, you're not going to be quite as effective as you're seeing him in this game. And remember, I had a bad start. I had a really bad spark. Um, spark. My uh, itemization was really poor. We weren't actually able to get a kill on the uh, Loon and the Venomancer until, um, I think, close to about seven or eight minutes in the game, either. Got a little bit of an awkward fight going on here. Um, this tree line patch right here, you can see that's really becoming a problem for us. They're kind of able to pelt us with Venomancer wards and shackles and other, you know, similarly rude abilities, and there's not a whole lot we can really do about it right now. Big mistake, too. They're really, they keep focusing me, but again, watch what I'm making sure that I am the very first one that they're able to hit. I want to make sure that nobody else is up here in the front lines. I want to be the one doing that. Queen of Pain taking an immense amount of damage here, which is nice. We actually are going to be able to uh, get a pick here, and that's going to be a tier 2 tower. And uh, so the Undying has his Ags. Um, I'm not a huge fan of this item on Undying, but I gotta say, like seeing how quickly that Queen of Pain died there with uh, having the Ags on, it's maybe it's not so bad sometimes. Like her health bar just absolutely erased, and a large part of that was due to the uh, damage amp from Undying Flesh Golem. So that's definitely nice. Trying to push it to Arax here. Um, it's getting to the point in the game where we realize we really do need to make a play happen. Again, I'm just coming up here, trying to do as much damage as I can, but they have so many slows, and it's kind of hard to really catch up to any of the people on this team. That would have been an excellent time to use an urn charge, by the way. That would have been a kill on the Venomancer, guaranteed. If I would have just thought to use my urn, I had one charge there, so I let a kill get away. Just little things like that can really make all the difference, and even so much of a difference as winning or losing the game. Uh, for example, now, they still have three heroes up, and a hero that's actually fairly good at defending Venomancer and his wards can actually be fairly good at stopping pushes. So, just little things like that can help. And this is where I go and I 1v3, try to help out the Brewmaster. And it's just not going to quite be enough. But you can see I'm staying alive a lot longer than I really have any right to. But there goes 1,362 1, gold to the enemy team. That is uh, not a good thing. I should have had my pipe coming to me ages ago as well. So. A lot of the seemingly small mistakes coming out of my end, but things that can really, really add up. Like, say, who who knows if it would have been different if this Venomancer would have died, you know, earlier. If I would have just used an urn charge on him, he would have been dead 100%. Also, now uh, Luna's uh, becoming fairly scary. She does have a butterfly finish, so a butterfly, Helm of the Dominator, BKB. So she's definitely able to fight at this point. And, uh, yeah, our Undying actually accidentally says in all chat, we need to end this fast. Like, yeah, yeah, we kind of do, buddy. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've, we've given away our strategy, guys. GG. Go new. But anyway, uh, I do have a, a hood done, pipe done, and uh, I'm going for a Shiva's Guard next. Um, again, I feel like my itemization here is actually quite poor. And again, the reason I say that is because you see how long I'm staying alive. I don't think that's a problem. I feel like a better choice here for me would be to transition into more of a carry role because there is absolutely no way our Brewmaster is going to be able to fulfill that. He is um, very good. Uh, I like this build a lot. Um, I would probably go pretty much these exact items if I were in his position. But at the same time, um, he's not going to be able to carry our team. He's fill fulfilling a purely utility role. And at this point in the game, like with, especially with Luna having that butterfly, he's going to start to fall off really, really hard. And that is going to be a Roshan for them as well. We're, we aren't aware they're doing this, but we have a pretty good idea. Um, Sheepstick up on Enchantress is excellent. That is a really good pickup here. But again, she's going to have to be able to stay alive. Her next item really should be a Black King Bar to ensure she's even going to be able to use any of these nice items. Otherwise, like say, if Ogre even gets off like a X2 multicast on her, she's probably dead. And that's just not a good thing. Undying's doing all right. Um, I do, definitely do like the hood pickup, the uh, scepter. I'm not a huge fan of, but um, starting to change my mind a little bit about it. Sometimes it, it definitely is giving him a lot more HP. His mana pool really don't have to worry about that now. And uh, they do have mainly magic damage, so I think this build is actually okay. I would not fault him for this. But again, my build here, I'm really trying to emphasize um, having a lot of armor. But again, I think what I'm not totally realizing is that if I'm not able to kill the enemy. I'm not going to be able to win the game. And it, it's at this point, too, where the rest of my team is going to die much, much, much before my hero does. So I really feel like going for, like, a basher here. Like a basher into an assault, or I'm sorry, a basher into an abyssal blade would have been a better choice. Because I feel like if I'm at least able to bash this Luna 
and just stay on top of her, I think I can actually take her on. If, even though Luna is a very respectably hard carry herself, I feel like if I'm able to get in there, bash her, especially with an Abyssal Blade for a guaranteed bash, uh, Bristleback's going to be able to give her a run for her money. But uh, at this point, I'm not doing that. Now, the advantages of having a Shiva's Guard, um, I don't want to discount the item. I really, really like Shiva's on Bristleback. Um, it plugs up any kind of mana issues you could really possibly have, which is nice. It's going to give me a ton of intelligence, so mana pool's not going to be an issue. A lot more armor, obviously. Having the uh, Assault Kyrus and a Shiva's Guard is going to make sure I have more armor than I probably need, but it's also going to make sure that I'm going to stay alive against the Luna a lot more. And also, the uh, Freezing Field Act, it was not something to underestimate. Um, bear in mind that that does go through BKB. It is excellent at clearing creep waves, and it applies a pretty respectable slow. You probably notice we've had a lot of trouble really staying on top of targets this game, like uh, the Queen of Pain especially, uh, Windrunner, um, basically anybody that can really slip away from us. Also, having a Venomancer on the, on the enemy team... It effectively kind of makes it so like it makes it so that if he gets off a gale or if his wards are hitting us with a lot of poison sting, we're all going to be pretty slow to begin with. So this kind of evens out the playing field. I uh, I like Shiva's guard a lot on this era, so definitely worth considering picking up. I'm going to go for a tier two tower here, and um, I'm not sure like, you can see how incredibly spread out they are all over the map right now. Just one TP is not going to do this. Um, okay, we do have two TPs coming in here. I really don't think they can defend this, though, in all honesty. No, I should have went on that. There's really no reason that I uh, I shouldn't have chased that, because what I should have noticed is the uh, Brewmaster chasing after the Queen of Pain. So what that basically did right there is that gave me an open license to initiate on the guys that tried to defend there. That's a huge mistake that I didn't initiate there. That's really a key thing of why it's so important to always be aware of what the enemy's doing and always keep your eye on the map at all times. That is a textbook example right there of uh, making that mistake. Just trying to farm up the rest of the uh, Shiva's Guard right now. I'm not terribly far away, just a couple more camps I'm going to be able to get there. So uh, let's take a look and see how things are looking right now. Um, you'll notice that we had a massive XP lead for most of the game, and, uh, you know, rightfully so, because we were... This is a team full of heroes that just love to get in and love to start killing people early. But now, things are really dipping back uh, down towards the Dyer's favor, which is not a good sign for us. And in terms of GPM, they actually have a very slight lead now, which is uh, not a good thing, obviously. We take a quick look at the uh, GPM levels here. Uh, the Luna has now exceeded me in GPM, so that's kind of scary. And uh, it's, it's, it's looking... it's tough. The, this is definitely a game that can go either way. Despite being up 11 kills, I know I mentioned this in a lot of my videos, but the kills are not everything. It can really, really come down to hero composition. Excuse me, and just how well uh, your heroes can scale into the late game as well. Do pick up my Shiva's Guard. That gives me a lovely total of 47 armor, which is about 75% uh, physical resistance, which is nice. So I'm going to be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with that Luna, that is for sure. But again, if my team can't stay alive, it's not even going to matter. It's also another reason why I really like Assault Kyrus is it's a huge benefit to your entire team as well. Being able to give armor to a naturally low HP hero like I'm dying, you know, giving him that uh, extra five Radiant armor is nice. And the, oh, I forgot to mention the uh, 20 attack speed in an R as well. That's really helpful, especially for heroes like Enchantress. Got a fight going on here. Um, the moment I'm unstunned, I blow my uh, Shivas and Pipe immediately, just make sure that I can get him off. Shiva's definitely helped out quite a bit there. It made sure I could keep up with that Venomancer and get a kill on him. Queen of Pain goes down really quickly. Luna's in the back doing work, though, and there's not a whole lot I can do to... I, I can't just walk up to her and try to kill her, because I'm going to start taking damage on the Tier 4 tower, so I'm just trying to do as much damage to that Tier 3 tower as I possibly can. And this is a time where it's time to back up. And yeah, now Luna's getting scary, and this is exactly what I was talking about. In that, if the Luna can just stay back and kind of do her thing, she's going to massacre my team. And I am the last man standing right now, so this is where things get kind of scary. They're definitely going to be able to push down mid here and uh, take out a mid tier too. And this is the point of the game too, where, where Bristleback starts to feel quite a bit less effective. Just because, well, you know, the, the, the quills are nice, but I mean, seriously, when you're up against... You know, a hero that has, you know, over 20 armor, close to 2,000 HP. The quills just... They're not going to stack up quite as much. They're just not really going to do... They're not going to feel anywhere near as effective as they were in the early game. 
this isn't really something that I can um, effectively defend. I can slow him down. Okay, we've actually got uh, two buybacks coming out here. I, I, I forgot about that. It's actually pretty good for us, because this looks like a very, very dead Luna. I should be using my Shivas here, by the way. I think I just forgot I had it. There we go. But the reason I say is because the uh, freezing field does go through BKB, which is nice. At least I'm, I'm almost sure I'm... The freezing field does, I'm almost... I believe the Arctic Blast does to the active. I'm almost sure that it does, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. I'm going to have to look that up. If I'm wrong, I'm sure someone's going to be uh, kind enough to point it out in the comments. This is also the point of the game, too. We're having the Vanguard in my inventory makes things really, really awkward. Like, I would much, much, much rather have a Heart of Jurassic right now, but it means I'm going to have to sell this thing or sell something. Like, the only thing, I can't really sell anything else except maybe my TP scroll, and, well, that's, uh, has not helped me out in the past either, but uh, I'm going to have to sell my Vanguard just to pick up that heart, and that's roughly about a thousand gold loss, so uh, that's not a good thing. Undying taking a lot of damage here. I really need to use my pipe. I use my pipe a little bit late. Um, not the end of the world, but it does mean my team took a little bit more damage than they needed to. Again, to use Freezing Field, try to slow down as many people as I can. Hit about three people with it, which is going to be helpful. And I need to go ahead and jump on this Luna and try to take her out. So, you can see I'm standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with her fairly well, but it's like, oh god, it's almost too much. By the way, she died to the uh, passive from Bristleback. This is an optimistic TP, but I am going to be able to make it out of there. Definitely a close call, that's for sure. So you can see I did uh, sell... decided to sell my TP there. Um... Not sure if that's the best choice. Uh, I say that just because we have this um, Wonder Girl over here with the uh, basically a, a Naked Necronomicon three, and she's just been split pushing all the time. So this is a scenario where, God, it, it's tough. Like I, I actually say this is one of the tougher decisions that I've had to face because I really don't want to get rid of the Vanguard. I still feel like it, it, its effectiveness is seriously, seriously diminished at this point. But uh, I kind of don't want to get rid of the HP that it's given me. But at the same time, I don't want to get rid of the TP. But at the same time, I don't really want to spend the money on Boots of Travel yet either. So, it's time to hit some creeps. So I'm going to do that for a little while. Talk about some other itemizations you can go on Bristleback. Um, if you really want to go like a carry roll, again, I feel that with Warpath having the 210 bonus damage at level 3 with 7 stacks of it, you really don't need many damage items. But if you were, um, I think... I've never went Radiance on this Radiant hero, but I can absolutely see how it, how it would be effective. The problem with Radiance is that this is an item that demands so much... It, it, it demands that you sit in, sit in the lane and pass the farm for a long time, and Bristleback needs items that are going to allow you to roam the map and get kills. You know, Urn, Wand, stuff like that. You know, the items that you saw me pick up earlier in the game. And I feel like going a Radiance, you're actually doing yourself a disservice, and if you're against any other kind of real carry, you know, like Animage, Faceless Void, etc., etc., that uh, this isn't really going to help all that much. And I feel like it's kind of a disservice to the hero to sit there and farm for 15 to 20 minutes just to get the Radiance up. However, I can see the synergy with Bristleback is uh, pretty good, uh, really good, actually, because Radiance is excellent heroes that simply don't die, uh, Lone Druid probably being uh, one of the best examples of that. I do pick up Boots of Travel now. I decide that um, it's worth me having the Boots of Travel, say, over the heart at this point. Not entirely sure if that was the correct choice, but again, that's why I make these videos. Uh, actually, it kind of helps me out more than anything, just watching my own play. Got quite a bit of damage coming out on me here, not too worried yet, and I'm going to blow the pipe and the uh, a little bit early on the Shivas, but that's okay. I do manage to catch at least one target with it. Just trying to force a fight here going in. Windrunner dropping super, super low. Pipe is down, but I think we, that we did get the full 400 damage block out of it, so definitely good use of it. Queen of Pain just barely gets away there. That is a buyback from the Ogre. And you can see I'm having a lot of trouble versus this Luna now. It's like, uh, oh, God. Uh. And, it, and again, you can see this entire time I'm, I'm still using Quill Spray. I want to make sure that I can at least keep up my movement speed here. That is going to be a dead bristleback, so that's unfortunate. And for them, um, they could pretty easily push down into our uh, our racks here. I believe that's what they do. Um, as for buybacks, uh, not looking good. Mine, the top here, let's, let's actually do it the proper way. So uh, no, we have no buybacks on our team. So uh, that's definitely looks like a racks for them. 
unless they go bot for some reason. Uh, what they should be doing here, and I really don't understand why you wouldn't do this, is just push as hard as you possibly can into here. The tier 2 is already pretty low, and then at least try to get a tier 4 off of this, because if I'm not alive, uh, my team really can't do much of anything. Bristleback is incredibly key here, and I'm dead for a pretty long time. Radio well, actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. I didn't realize Tier 2 was down, so yeah, what they're doing here is uh, fine, and what they should be doing. Um, that is not a good glyph at all. Uh, whenever you glyph like this, um, God, they really don't need that. Actually, that was not a bad glyph. If it saves the racks, okay, well, still didn't save the racks, unfortunately, but um, the reason that I say that wasn't a good glyph is because if you can't defend your building anyway, like, I didn't realize our respawn timers were so close. We still lost the racks regardless, which sucks. But um, if you can't def defend the building anyway, don't use your glyph. Like, say, if th this tier 2 tower is going to die, pretty much no matter what. It's, it's just going to happen. But if there's no one around to even defend the thing, don't use your glyph, because the glyph can honestly make or break a game. It really can. That five seconds of invulnerability can really make all the difference in the world. But um, some other good items you can pick up on uh, Bristleback if you want to go like a hard carry roll. Um, I feel like you get so much free damage that uh, going something like a Mjolnir can be really, really nice. Gives you a ton of attack speed, so you get a lot of attack speed and you get all the damage from Warpath. So I feel like it. basically items that give you a lot of attack speed can be really effective. That is going to be uh, Aegis for, for them. And I think that was a Cheese too. Is that the third Roshan? Had to have been. Yep. So it's now a cheese. Cheese. Okay. Um, I actually remember this, and I want to talk about this. So, Queen of Pain picking up both the Aegis and the cheese, this is an enormous mistake. And uh, I'll kind of explain it this way. Think of it as, like, um, getting the Aegis of the Immortal and Skeleton King. If you die three times, odds are your team all around you is dead anyway, so what good is it if you can come back to life three times? Right? Or, I'm sorry, come back to life twice and, uh, you know, have three lives. So... The reason this is so bad is <laughs> because if the queen goes in the fight and she dies, like, it, or like, like say the queen goes in the fight, uses the cheese, but the, if the fight goes in our favor at all, as in if they don't wipe us, it means that whenever her E just does pop, she's going to come back and the rest of her team is going to be dead. That's just all there is to it. Having this, say, like on Luna would be much more devastating, and I would even argue that... Uh, Actually, we do have a, a fight going on here. Um, not sure how to feel about that initiation by them either. So, yeah, the Queen of Pain is up here trying to tank some damage. She does not use her cheese. She chooses instead to uh, let the Aegis of the Immortal pop first. Venomancer dies almost instantly. And she's going to blink away. Oh, oh I, I didn't even... God, we even killed the Luna, too. So, uh, that's great. That's extremely good for us. So, this is really the chance that we were waiting for. But you can see what, what I mean by that. She should have popped cheese, by the way. That would have made a huge impact. Being dead for that couple of seconds just because she didn't use cheese there probably made all the difference in the world. I'm not sure if she was stunned or she just decided not to use it there, but uh, regardless, that was a uh, very big mistake on her part. Trying to push into at least the first set of racks here. At least being able to counter racks then would be an enormous help at this point. Thankfully that shackle didn't land, so... And yet again, notice I'm using my quills non-stop because I want to make sure I keep these stacks of warpath up. You want to make sure that you're doing as much damage as you can. Getting a little ambitious here. Um, I, I feel like that um, our approach was a mistake. We probably shouldn't be trying to, to tier 4 them at this point. Windrunner does go down, so that's going to help. Uh, Venomancer's getting in pretty deep himself. He is going to die as well. That's going to be a buyback from Windrunner, though, and whole team's getting pretty low. And whenever you have a Venomancer Poison Nova, you'd be surprised at just how low your health gets. This does so much damage over extended sieges like this, and it's an incredibly potent counter versus that. Radiant's top right. Looks like we're on the retreat now. I really should not have walked back into that. Use the freezing field, slow them down. You can see how effective that freezing field is in keeping people slowed down. Very, very helpful. And it's time for a TP back to the base. So, I'm going to live, so that's a good thing. But at the same time, uh, guess what happened? We're, well, <laughs> guess what's about to happen? Uh, we just lost our range racks, and uh, our melee is taking a ton of damage. Look at them catapults. 
I didn't notice this at the time. I should have TP'd to our racks. Oh my god. Oh god. Oh. 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 Oh, oh god. Okay. Um, I didn't notice this at the time, but uh, I should have TP'd top and defended that. That is an enormous loss for us. Oh god. Ugh. Radiance well, towers coming apart. You know what they say. Um, sometimes you just don't know what the hell you're doing, right? <laughs> but, uh, okay, we now have um, two Necro 3s on the enemy team, so that's great. They're going for the throat here. They're trying to go for the last set of racks, and if they get uh, Mega Creeps up, things are going to be a lot tougher for us. No bringing down the Radiant structures like this. I would actually say that Yule's probably did a lot more... Uh, did a lot... It helped me more... Didn't hurt them. Now that man, that finger of death, Jesus. She exploded. So by them trying to do that, it actually might have uh, hurt them quite a bit. They have a uh, two pretty key heroes down, not to mention the Luna, obviously. So that's going to be a successful defense, and I have an immense amount of gold right now. And this is the time where I really need to be picking up my heart. I feel like even if I pick up heart, I would have enough money for buyback too. Let's see, 1852. Yeah, yeah, I think that'd be fine. Radiance mid racks ain't looking so hot. This is where you scream over voice chat, charge, like, oh, to hell, to hell with that, that racks, it's fine. So, I'm actually going to pause it here just for a quick second because I want to artic articulate my thought. So, you'll notice that I did pan my screen back and I saw that the racks was being attacked. The way that I feel about this is that if we don't go for the throat right now, which is to say the ancient, I don't feel like we're going to win. I can't say for sure if this is the right call or not, but I feel like at this point in the game, our heroes have fallen off enough that we simply uh, can't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them anymore. Like, oh my god, I didn't realize I actually have three Necro books. So yeah, there's a Necro 3, Necro 3, Necro 2. He's going to have Necro 3 pretty soon. So they, they are very... We cannot outpush them. There's absolutely no way. There's just no way we can outpush this team. We don't have the heroes to do it, and we especially don't have the Necro books to do it. Just not going to happen. So I feel like at this point, like, all right, guys, we, we've got to go for the gut. We have to kill the Ancient. So that's my thought process there. But uh, let's see how that goes for us. <laughs> I'm not giving away any spoilers. But needless to say, it's a uh, game could very, very easily go either way here. Unfortunately, that leaves me not quite enough mana to pipe. Pretty big mistake on my part there. I could be preventing a lot of damage to my team right now. You can see how low the Undying and the Brewmaster are. So that's that's not the best thing. And and again, something I always emphasize too is it doesn't matter what your score is. I mean, if you're making poor decisions that can affect your team this much, like especially when the game is this... Okay, we got buybacks coming out all over the place. Brewmaster buying back. He's in Boots of Travel to get back into the fight here. Queen of Pain buying back. Venomancer buying back as well. And it's just not looking good. This uh, I think the Brewmaster's going to commit the old die back. Yeah, there's not much I can do to help him either. I'm completely out of mana at this point. I think I stayed on the field a bit too long. But you can see what I, I meant there. Like, by using the Sheba's Guard, I left myself not enough mana to use Pipe. And I think my team died for it. Yeah, he calls the GG. But uh, I'm not quite ready to give up yet. So um, what I was saying before is it doesn't matter what your score is. Like, you, you know, I'm 22, 2, and 16 right now. But... If it comes down to the wire and you make decisions that can like make or break the game, it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is uh, do you have enough money to buy a divine rig here? Okay, I'm gonna explain my thought process here because I I don't want to encourage people to just buy rapiers for the hell of it. Here's how I see it. I'm gonna pause because this is actually one of the very few games where I feel like I can really. Um, fully describe whenever you should buy a Divine Rapier. And this is a game where I feel like there was simply no other choice. Okay? We're about to get hit by Mega Creeps here. This is really not defendable. They have three Necro Books. We have uh, three heroes up right now. This set of racks is going to go down. There is absolutely no way to avoid this, and it is inevitable. If we try to defend this, we will die. The only, like, the, the only possible way that we have right now to win this game is we're going to have to let these racks go down, and we're actually going to have to wait for these guys to respawn, because we cannot, th we really can't 3v4 right now. There's no way. Well, there, there really is only one way. If we're forced to fight, as in they take the racks, and they threaten our Ancient, which they're very likely to do, we have to fight. I have to get a Divine Rapier to actually give me enough damage to do so. So, with a Divine Rapier on top of this, it's like, 
510 damage on top of my base. Pretty good, so I'm going to be hitting pretty hard. But uh, you can see what I mean by this, that even if I did have buyback, buyback would not make any difference at all right now. Because if I buy back, who cares? I'm, I'm going to be the only one in the field, and they're just going to kill me again. So this is a situation where, yes, you should consider going all-in. This is definitely an all-in maneuver. Get a Divine Rapier, understand that you absolutely have to fight. Know when to save for buyback, and know when buyback is not going to help you. So that's my thought process behind this. Um, I look forward to any discussion that you guys might have about this in the comments. I feel like this is actually um, a really interesting um, just chain of logic here. If you disagree with me, um, I'd definitely like to hear it and your reasons for it. And you know, who knows, I might even change my mind at some point too, but um, I feel like this was absolutely the right choice this game. My item progression throughout the rest of the game has been um, arguably quite bad, and I hope that I've pointed out my feelings as to why, but uh, yep, it's rapier time. So let's see how this goes. I know that I, I really can't get too close, but again, you can see what I mean by this. That is absolutely undefendable, especially against Luna. There's no way. Radiance mid rags. And that's going to be mega creeps for them. Mid -rags. Is that the pick has got a case of the and as I'm sure um, you well know, uh, okay, this is a heinously bad mistake by them. They backed off. However, like what that means is there is a very, 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 very slight chance we can still win this game. I say very, very slight because, um, as I'm sure you well know, once once the Mega Creeps come out, the game is pretty much over. I mean, look at these things. They hit for 100 damage, they have 1,270 HP, held the range ones, hits for 133. It's pretty much over at this point. Like, they're... because you simply can't push out your lanes to even get to their base anymore. It, it's just not going to happen. As you can see here, we're, we're trying to defend. Like, even our five heroes, like, we're even having trouble defending against us. They're just going to slowly whittle our base down. There's really not a whole lot we can do about it. We can sit here and try to defend, but that's really about it. So even though I didn't get to use my rapier, <clears throat> at least yet, I still have it. Oh, God. <laughs> this game. I'm so glad I was able to get the replay for this, but... Uh, Another thing I want to point out, too, is um, just how critical of a mistake that was, that they didn't push into our base and end the game. There's no reason Radiant that they should not have done that. We had two heroes that were still dead for at least, like, 20 and 30 seconds each. It might have even been, like, 30 and 40 seconds each. We didn't have the Brewmaster or the Enchantress. Um, arguably two critical heroes um, for our defense, just our general gameplay. But uh, they chose not to. They chose to back up. That's... Huge mistake. Huge, 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 huge mistake. Now, not, not to say they're probably not going to win anyway, because they have the Mega Creeps up now, but still, it's they, they could have finished the game very, very easily at that point. I do decide to finish my heart because, um, again, it's important to understand that having buyback at this point is completely pointless. There's really no purpose for it. Where buyback is very important is, say, if you still have sets of racks up, they're going to go ahead and try to you know, racks here, or take a second set of racks. Let's say you die very early on in the fight as the carry, like say if I was playing Luna and I was the first one to go down, that is absolutely time to buy back. It's going to be a kill on the Queen of Pain, which is always nice. Doesn't make a lot of difference, and you can see here, like, if we leave a lane even for a second, this happens. Mega Creeps, are, you really can't do a whole lot about it. Matter of fact, uh, this is pretty much what happens for the next couple of minutes, so I'm going to speed things up a little bit. I'll keep an eye, make sure we don't miss any action, but, uh, yep. Normally I don't do that, by the way. I say scared in all chat, but, like, this is pretty absurd. There is absolutely no reason they cannot finish this game. This, uh, yet again, was a relatively low-skill match, just in terms of overall matchmaking, um, as you might be able to tell, but, uh, yeah, that, see, the loon is nice. I respect all of you. So, yeah, no hard feelings, but for God's sake, in the game, you know, we, we're at the 60-minute mark now. <laughs> Stole the Aegis and Cheese. <laughs> Killing this Windrunner isn't really going to do anything for us. Because of this. <laughs> oh boy. Getting, getting down to the wire here. They do have two enemy heroes dead, which is kind of helpful, but still, we're about to lose uh, our last tower as well. There's, there is really nothing you can do against these Mega Creeps. But then, uh, <laughs> something amazing happens. So, our Undying 
actually gets a, a pretty good idea, and the, the guy, I, I don't know what nationality he was, but his English wasn't all that great, but he, uh, he pops on the mic, Guys, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Undying, we can hear you. What is it? And he actually says to the Enchantress to uh, enchant the creep, and uh, we're going to do something pretty cool with this. So if you guys have never seen this before, um, what you can do uh, with like Enchantress or Chen, or if you have a Helm and the Dominator, is enchant a creep, um, smoke the creep, take the creep into the enemy base, that removes the backdoor protection. So that is our absolute last, like, only hope to win this game. Rose won't be coming back for a while. And that's going to be yet another uh, cheese. I guess they're just not taking it. Well... <laughs> they just leave the... I didn't even know they just left the cheese. Oh my... Okay, then I mean she takes the cheese. But, um... Alright, so... The way this works is... The creep is smoked on a stealth mission. The mission of his life. And he's going into the base. And the idea is that we're going to boot to travel to the creep and try to finish the game. So... This is where things really, really, really get intense. And, uh... Oh, uh, this is one of the... One of the coolest plays I've seen in a very long time. I notice the Windrunner sees the creep. I start screaming her voice chat. Now, 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 go now. It is our absolute only chance. So we're going into the base. This creep has to stay alive. If it doesn't, there's no way we can win this game. Alright, now, let's take a look at what's happening here. We're attacking their ancient. It's taken a lot of damage. Remember, I still have this rapier. I am hitting for a lot of damage right now. We have three heroes here, our three damage dealers. And uh, back here at the base, um, it's not looking too good. We have Glyph. They also have Glyph. Start it back up. I, couldn't hang on to that I choose to go ahead and, uh, and blow Glyph just before the tower dies, just to keep try to keep it up. And uh, they don't respond in time, and they don't blow Glyph, and we win the game. Uh, definitely one of the best games of Dota that I have ever experienced. My uh, own performance, I've actually, I've definitely played uh, better Bristleback games, just in terms of my own personal performance and my decisions I made, but. Uh, other than that, this was an excellent game of Dota. And uh, Undying and Enchantress, if you're out there, you guys are awesome. I love you. And yeah, it was the Undying's idea. But that's just a uh, pretty cool example of how you can make use of the uh, game mechanics and take what seems like a completely unwinnable scenario and uh, come out with a victory. So that was nice and a game I will remember forever. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, any questions, comments, I would love to hear them from you. And uh, you should be hearing from me again soon. Take care.